I said in the last chapter that the sea was rough in Bombay Harbour, not an unusual thing in the Arabian Sea in June and July. It had been choppy all the way from Aden. Almost every passenger was sick. I alone was in perfect form, staying on deck to see the stormy surge and enjoying the splash of the waves. At breakfast there would be just one or two people besides myself eating their oatmeal porridge from plates carefully held in their laps lest the porridge itself find its place there. The outer storm was to me a symbol of the inner, but even as the former left me unperturbed, I think I can say the same thing about the latter. There was the trouble with the cast that was to confront me. I have already adverted to my helplessness in starting on my profession. And then, as I was a reformer, I was taxing myself as to how best to begin certain reforms. But there was even more in store for me than I knew. My elder brother had come to meet me at the dock. He had already made the acquaintance of Dr. Mehta and his elder brother, and as Dr. Mehta insisted on putting me up at his house, we went there. Thus the acquaintance began in England, continued in India, and ripened into a permanent friendship between the two families. I was pining to see my mother. I did not know that she was no more in the flesh to receive me back into her bosom. The sad news was now given to me, and I underwent the usual ablution. My brother had kept me ignorant of her death, which took place whilst I was still in England. He wanted to spare me the blow in a foreign land. The news, however, was nonetheless a severe shock to me. But I must not dwell upon it. My grief was even greater than over my father's death. Most of my cherished hopes were shattered. But I remember that I did not give myself up to any wild expression of grief. I could even check the tears and took to life just as though nothing had happened. Dr. Mehta introduced me to several friends, one of them being his brother, Sri Ravashankar Jagjivan, with whom there grew up a lifelong friendship. But the introduction that I need particularly take note of was the one to the poet Raychand or Raj Chandra, the son-in-law of an elder brother of Dr. Mehta and partner of the firm of jewelers conducted in the name of Ravashankar Jagjivan. He was not above twenty-five then. But my first meeting with him convinced me that he was a man of great character and learning. He was also known as Shatavadhani, one having the faculty of remembering or attending to a hundred things simultaneously. And Dr. Mehta recommended me to see some of his memory feats. I exhausted my vocabulary of all the European tongues I knew and asked the poet to repeat the words. He did so in the precise order in which I had given them. I envied his gift without, however, coming under its spell. The thing that did cast its spell over me, I came to know afterwards. This was his wide knowledge of the scriptures, his spotless character and his burning passion for self-realization. I saw later that this last was the only thing for which he lived. The following lines of Muktanand were always on his lips and engraved on the tablets of his heart. I shall think myself blessed only when I see him in every one of my daily acts. Verily, he is the thread which supports Muktanand's life. Rechand Bhai's commercial transactions covered hundreds of thousands. He was a connoisseur of pearls and diamonds. No naughty business problem was too difficult for him. But all these things were not the center round which his life revolved. That center was the passion to see God face to face. Amongst the things on his business table, there were invariably to be found some religious book and his diary. The moment he finished his business, he opened the religious book or the diary. Much of his published writings is a reproduction from this diary. The man who, immediately on finishing his talk about weighty business transaction, began to write about the hidden things of the spirit could evidently not be a businessman at all, but a real seeker after truth. And I saw him thus absorbed in godly pursuits in the midst of business not once or twice but very often. 
I never saw him lose his state of equipoise. There was no business or other selfish tie that bound him to me, and yet I enjoyed the closest association with him. I was but a briefless barrister then, and yet whenever I saw him, he would engage me in conversation of a seriously religious nature. Though I was then groping and could not be said to have any serious interest in religious discussion, still I found his talk of absorbing interest. I have since met many a religious leader or teacher. I have tried to meet the heads of various faiths, and I must say that no one else has ever made on me the impression that Rechand Bhai did. His words went straight home to me. His intellect compelled as great a regard from me as his moral earnestness, and deep down in me was the conviction that he would never willingly lead me astray and would always confide to me his innermost thoughts. In my moments of spiritual crisis, therefore, he was my refuge. And yet, in spite of this regard for him, I could not enthrone him in my heart as my guru. The throne has remained vacant and my search still continues. I believe in the Hindu theory of Guru and his importance in spiritual realization. I think there is a great deal of truth in the doctrine that true knowledge is impossible without a Guru. An imperfect teacher may be tolerable in mundane matters but not in spiritual matters. Only a perfect Jnani deserves to be enthroned as a Guru. There must therefore be ceaseless striving after perfection. For one gets the Guru that one deserves. Infinite striving after perfection is one's right. It is its own reward. The rest is in the hands of God. Thus, though I could not place Rechand Bhai on the throne of my heart as Guru, we shall see he was, on many occasions, my guide and helper. Three moderns have left a deep impress on my life and captivated me. Rechand Bhai by his living contact, Tolstoy by his book, The Kingdom of God is Within You, and Ruskin by his unto this last, but of these more in their proper place. My elder brother had built high hopes on me. The desire for wealth and name and fame were great in him. He had a big heart, generous to a fault. This combined with his simple nature had attracted to him many friends and through them he expected to get me briefs. He had also assumed that I should have a swinging practice and had, in that expectation, allowed the household expenses to become top-heavy. He had also left no stone unturned in preparing the field for my practice. The storm in my caste over my foreign voyage was still brewing. It had divided the caste into two camps, one of which immediately readmitted me, while the other was bent on keeping me out. To please the former, my brother took me to Nasik before going to Rajkot, gave me a bath in the sacred river and, on reaching Rajkot, gave a caste dinner. I did not like all this. But my brother's love for me was boundless and my devotion to him was in proportion to it, and so I mechanically acted as he wished, taking his will to be the law. The trouble about readmission to the caste was thus practically over. I never tried to seek admission to the section that had refused it, nor did I feel even mental resentment against any of the headmen of that section. Some of these regarded me with dislike, but I scrupulously avoided hurting their feelings. I fully respected the caste regulations about excommunication. According to these, none of my relations, including my father-in-law and mother-in-law, and even my sister and brother-in-law, could entertain me and I would not so much as drink water at their houses. They were prepared secretly to evade the prohibition, but it went against the grain with me to do a thing in secret that I would not do in public. The result of my scrupulous conduct was that I never had an occasion to be troubled by the caste. Nay, I have experienced nothing but affection and generosity from the general body of the section that still regards me as excommunicated. They have even helped me in my work without ever expecting me to do anything for the caste. It is my conviction that all these good things are due to my non-resistance. Had I agitated for being admitted to the caste, 
Had I attempted to divide it into more camps, had I provoked the castmen, they would surely have retaliated and instead of steering clear of the storm, I should on arrival from England have found myself in a whirlpool of agitation and perhaps a party to dissimulation. My relations with my wife was still not as I desired. Even my stay in England had not cured me of jealousy. I continued my squeamishness and suspiciousness in respect of every little thing and hence all my cherished desires remained unfulfilled. I had decided that my wife should learn reading and writing and that I should help her in her studies, but my lust came in the way and she had to suffer for my own shortcoming. Once I went the length of sending her away to her father's house and consented to receive her back only after I had made her thoroughly miserable. I saw later that all this was a pure folly on my part. I had planned reform in the education of children. My brother had children and my own child, which I had left at home when I went to England, was now a boy of nearly four. It was my desire to teach these little ones physical exercise and make them hardy and also to give them the benefit of my personal guidance. In this I had my brother's support and I succeeded in my efforts more or less. I very much liked the company of children and the habit of playing and joking with them has stayed with me till today. I have ever since thought that I should make a good teacher of children. The necessity for food reform was obvious. Tea and coffee had already found their place in the house. My brother had thought it fit to keep some sort of English atmosphere ready for me on my return and to that end crockery and such other things which used to be kept in the house only for special occasions were now in general use. My reform put the finishing touch. I introduced oatmeal porridge and coca was to replace tea and coffee. But in truth it became an addition to tea and coffee. Boots and shoes were already there. I completed the Europeanization by adding the European dress. Expenses thus went up. New things were added every day. We had succeeded in tying a white elephant at our door. But how was the wherewithal to be found? To start practice in Rajkot would have meant sure ridicule. I had hardly the knowledge of a qualified vakil and yet I expected to be paid ten times his fees. No client would be fool enough to engage me. And even if such a one was to be found, should I add arrogance and fraud to my ignorance and increase the burden of debt I owed to the world? Friends advised me to go to Bombay for some time in order to gain experience of the High Court, to study Indian law and to try to get what briefs I could. I took up the suggestion and went. In Bombay, I started a household with a cook as incompetent as myself. He was a Brahman. I did not treat him as a servant but as a member of the household. He would pour water over himself but never wash. His dhoti was dirty as also his sacred thread and he was completely innocent of the scriptures. But how was I to get a better cook? Well, Ravi Shankar, for that was his name, I would ask him, you may not know cooking but surely you must know your sandhya, that is daily worship. Sandhya, sir. The plough is our sandhya and is paid our daily ritual. That is the type of Brahman I am. I must live on your mercy, otherwise agriculture is of course there for me. So I had to be Ravi Shankar's teacher. Time I had enough. I began to do half the cooking myself and introduced the English experiments in vegetarian cookery. I invested in a stove and with Ravi Shankar began to run the kitchen. I had no scruples about interdining. Ravi Shankar too came to have none and so we went on merrily together. There was only one obstacle. Ravi Shankar had sworn to remain dirty and to keep his food unclean. But it was impossible for me to get along in Bombay for more than four or five months, there being no income to square with the ever increasing expenditure. This was how I began life. I found the barrister's profession a bad job, much show and little knowledge. I felt a crushing sense of my responsibility. While in Bombay I began on the one hand my study of Indian law and on the other my experiments in dietetics in which Veerchand Gandhi, a friend, joined me. 
My brother, for his part, was trying his best to get me briefs. The study of Indian law was a tedious business. The civil procedure code I could in no way get on with. Not so, however, with the Evidence Act. Veer Chand Gandhi was reading for the solicitor's examination and would tell me all sorts of stories about barristers and vakils. Sir Firoz Shah's ability, he would say, lies in his profound knowledge of law. Sir Firoz Shah's ability, he would say, lies in his profound knowledge of law. He has the evidence act by heart and knows all the cases on the 32nd section. Badruddin Tiabji's wonderful power of argument inspires the judges with awe. The stories of stalwarts such as this would unnerve me. It is not unusual, he would add, for a barrister to vegetate for five or seven years. That is why I have signed the article for solicitorship. You should count yourself lucky if you can paddle your own canoe in three years time. Expenses were mounting up every month. To have a barrister's board outside the house, whilst still preparing for the barrister's profession inside, was a thing to which I could not reconcile myself. Hence I could not give undivided attention to my studies. I developed some liking for the Evidence Act and read Maine's Hindu law with deep interest, but I had not the courage to conduct a case. I was helpless beyond words, even as the bride come fresh to her father-in-law's house. About this time I took up the case of one Mami Bai. It was a small cause. You will have to pay some commission to the tout, I was told. I emphatically declined. But even that great criminal lawyer Mr. So-and-so, who makes three to four thousand a month, pays commission. I do not need to emulate him, I rejoined. I should be content with three hundred a month. Father did not get more. But those days are gone. Expenses in Bombay have gone up frightfully. You must be businesslike. I was adamant. I gave no commission, but got Mami Bai's case all the same. It was an easy case. I charged rupees thirty for my fees. The case was not likely to last longer than a day. This was my debut in the small causes court. I appeared for the defendant and had thus to cross-examine the plaintiff's witnesses. I stood up, but my heart sank into my boots. My head was reeling and I felt as though the whole court was doing likewise. I could think of no question to ask. The judge must have laughed and the vakils no doubt enjoyed the spectacle. But I was past seeing anything. I sat down and told the agent that I could not conduct the case, that he had better engage Patel and have the fee back from me. Mr. Patel was duly engaged for rupees 51. To him, of course, the case was a child's play. I hastened from the court, not knowing whether my client won or lost her case, but I was ashamed of myself and decided not to take up any more cases until I had courage enough to conduct them. Indeed, I did not go to court again until I went to South Africa. There was no virtue in my decision. I had simply made a virtue of necessity. There would be no one so foolish as to entrust his case to me, only to lose it. But there was another case in store for me at Bombay. It was a memorial to be drafted. A poor Muslim's land was confiscated in poor Bandar. He approached me as the worthy son of a worthy father. His case appeared to be weak, but I consented to draft a memorial for him, the cost of printing to be borne by him. I drafted it and read it out to friends. They approved of it and that to some extent made me feel confident that I was qualified enough to draft a memorial as indeed I really was. My business could flourish if I drafted memorials without any fees. But that would bring no grist to the mill. So I thought I might take up a teacher's job. My knowledge of English was good enough and I should have loved to teach English to matriculation boys in some school. In this way, I could have met part at least of the expenses. I came across an advertisement in the papers. Wanted an English teacher to teach one hour daily. Salary rupees 75. The advertisement was from a famous high school. I applied for the post and was called for an interview. I went there in high spirits, but when the principal found that I was not a graduate, 
he regretfully refused me. But I have passed the London matriculation with Latin as my second language. True, but we want to graduate. There was no help for it. I wrung my hands in despair. My brother also felt much worried. We both came to the conclusion that it was no use spending more time in Bombay. I should settle in Rajkot where my brother, himself a petty pleader, could give me some work in the shape of drafting applications and memorials. And then, as there was already a household at Rajkot, the breaking up of the one at Bombay meant a considerable saving. I liked the suggestion. My little establishment was thus closed after a stay of six months in Bombay. I used to attend High Court daily whilst in Bombay, but I cannot say that I learned anything there. I had not sufficient knowledge to learn much. Often I could not follow the cases and dozed off. There were others also who kept me company in this and thus lightened my load of shame. After a time, I even lost the sense of shame as I learned to think that it was fashionable to doze in the High Court. If the present generation has also its briefless barristers like me in Bombay, I would commend them a little practical precept about living. Although I lived in Girgaon, I hardly ever took a carriage or a tram car. I had made it a rule to walk to the High Court. It took me quite 45 minutes and of course I invariably returned home on foot. I had inured myself to the heat of the sun. This walk to and from the court saved a fair amount of money and when many of my friends in Bombay used to fall ill, I do not remember having once had an illness. Even when I began to earn money, I kept up the practice of walking to and from the office and I am still reaping the benefits of that practice. Disappointed, I left Bombay and went to Rajkot where I set up my own office. Here I got along moderately well. Drafting applications and memorials brought me in on an average rupees 300 a month. For this work I had to thank influence rather than my own ability for my brother's partner had a settled practice. All applications etc. which were really or to his mind of an important character he sent to big barristers. To my lot fell the applications to be drafted on behalf of his poor clients. I must confess that here I had to compromise the principle of giving no commission, which in Bombay I had so scrupulously observed. I was told that conditions in the two cases were different, that whilst in Bombay commissions had to be paid to the touts, here they had to be paid to the vakils who briefed you. And that here, as in Bombay, all barristers without exception paid a percentage of their fees as commission. The argument of my brother was for me unanswerable. You see, said he, that I am in partnership with another vakil. I shall always be inclined to make over to you all our cases with which you can possibly deal and if you refuse to pay a commission to my partner, you are sure to embarrass me. As you and I have a joint establishment, your fee comes to our common purse and I automatically get a share. But what about my partner? Supposing he gave the same case to some other barrister, he would certainly get his commission from him. I was taken in by this plea and felt that if I was to practice as a barrister, I could not press my principle regarding commissions in such cases. That is how I argued with myself or to put it bluntly, how I deceived myself. Let me add, however, that I do not remember ever to have given commission in respect of any other case. Though I thus began to make both ends meet, I got the first shock of my life about this time. I had heard what a British officer was like, but up to now had never been face to face with one. My brother had been secretly an advisor to the late Rana Sahib of Porbandar before he was installed on his gaddi, and hanging over his head at this time was the charge of having given wrong advice when in that office. The matter had gone to the political agent who was prejudiced against my brother. Now I had known this officer when in England 
and he may be said to have been fairly friendly to me. My brother thought that I should avail myself of the friendship and, putting in a good word on his behalf, try to disabuse the political agent of his prejudice. I did not at all like this idea. I should not, I thought, try to take advantage of a trifling acquaintance in England. If my brother was really at fault, what use was my recommendation? If he was innocent, he should submit a petition in the proper course and, confident of his innocence, face the result. My brother did not relish this advice. You do not know Katya Ward, he said, and you have yet to know the world. Only influence counts here. It is not proper for you, a brother, to shirk your duty when you can clearly put in a good word about me to an officer you know. I could not refuse him, so I went to the officer, much against my will. I knew I had no right to approach him and was fully conscious that I was compromising my self-respect. But I sought an appointment and got it. I reminded him of the old acquaintance, but I immediately saw that Katya Ward was different from England. That an officer on leave was not the same as an officer on duty. The political agent earned the acquaintance, but the reminder seemed to stiffen him. Surely you have not come here to abuse that acquaintance, have you? Appeared to be the meaning of that stiffness and seemed to be written on his brow. Nevertheless, I opened my case. The sahib was impatient. Your brother is an intriguer. I want to hear nothing more from you. I have no time. If your brother has anything to say, let him apply through the proper channel. The answer was enough, was perhaps deserved. But selfishness is blind. I went on with my story. The sahib got up and said, You must go now. But please hear me out, said I. That made him more angry. He called his peon and ordered him to show me the door. I was still hesitating when the pune came in, placed his hands on my shoulders and put me out of the room. The sahib went away as also the pune, and I departed, fretting and fuming. I at once wrote out and sent over a note to this effect. You have insulted me. You have assaulted me through your pune. If you make no amends, I shall have to proceed against you. Quick came the answer through his sovar. You were rude to me. I asked you to go and you would not. I had no option but to order my peon to show you the door. Even after he asked you to leave the office, you did not do so. He therefore had to use just enough force to send you out. You are at liberty to proceed as you wish. With this answer in my pocket, I came home crestfallen and told my brother all that had happened. He was grieved but was at a loss as to how to console me. He spoke to his wakil friends, for I did not know how to proceed against the sahib. Sir Firoz Shah Mehta happened to be in Rajkot at this time, having come down from Bombay for some case. But how could a junior barrister like me dare to see him? So I sent him the papers of my case through the wakil who had engaged him and begged for his advice. Tell Gandhi, he said, such things are the common experience of many wakils and barristers. He is still fresh from England and hot-blooded. He does not know British officers. If he would earn something and have an easy time here, let him tear up the note and pocket the insult. He will gain nothing by proceeding against the sahib and on the contrary will very likely ruin himself. Tell him he has yet to know life. The advice was as bitter as poison to me, but I had to swallow it. I pocketed the insult, but also profited by it. Never again shall I place myself in such a false position. Never again shall I try to exploit friendship in this way, said I to myself. And since then, I have never been guilty of a breach of that determination. This shock changed the course of my life. I was no doubt at fault in having gone to that officer. But his impatience and overbearing anger were out of all proportion to my mistake. It did not warrant expulsion. I can scarcely have taken up more than five minutes of his time. But he simply could not endure my talking. He could have politely asked me to go, 
but Pavo had intoxicated him to an inordinate extent. Later, I came to know that patience was not one of the virtues of this officer. It was usual for him to insult his visitors. The slightest unpleasantness was sure to put the sahib out. Now most of my work would naturally be in his court. It was beyond me to conciliate him. I had no desire to curry favor with him. Indeed, having once threatened to proceed against him, I did not like to remain silent. Meanwhile, I began to learn something of the petty politics of the country. Kathiawad, being a conglomeration of small states, naturally had its rich crop of politicals, petty intrigues between states, and intrigues of officers for power were the order of the day. Princes were always at the mercy of others and ready to lend their ears to psychopaths. Even the Sahib Supyun had to be cajoled, and the Sahib Shirasadar was more than his master, as he was his eyes, his ears, and his interpreter. The Shirastadar's will was law, and his income was always reputed to be more than the Sahib's. This may have been an exaggeration, but he certainly lived beyond his salary. This atmosphere appeared to me to be poisonous, and how to remain unscathed was a perpetual problem for me. I was thoroughly depressed and my brother clearly saw it. We both felt that if I could secure some job, I should be free from this atmosphere of intrigue. But without intrigue, a ministership or a judgeship was out of the question, and the quarrel with the sahib stood in the way of my practice. Poor Bandha was then under administration and I had some work there in the shape of securing more powers for the prince. Also I had to see the administrator in respect of the heavy vigoti that is land rent exacted from the mayors. This officer though an Indian was, I found, one better than the sahib in arrogance. He was able but the riots appeared to me to be none the better off for his ability. I succeeded in securing a few more powers for the Rana, but hardly any relief for the mayors. It struck me that their cause was not even carefully gone into. So, even in this mission I was comparatively disappointed. I thought justice was not done to my clients, but I had not the means to secure it. At the most I could have appealed to the political agent or to the governor, who would have dismissed the appeal, saying, we declined to interfere. If there had been any rule or regulation governing such decisions, it would have been something, but here the sahib's will was law. I was exasperated. In the meantime, a memon firm from Porbandar wrote to my brother making the following offer. We have business in South Africa. Ours is a big firm and we have a big case there in the court, our claim being 40,000 pounds. It has been going on for a long time. We have engaged the services of the best vakils and barristers. If you sent your brother there, he would be useful to us and also to himself. He would be able to instruct our counsel better than ourselves. And he would have the advantage of seeing a new part of the world and of making new acquaintances. My brother discussed the proposition with me. I could not clearly make out whether I had simply to instruct the council or to appear in court, but I was tempted. My brother introduced me to the late Sheikh Abdul Karim Javeri, a partner of Dada, Abdullah & Co., the firm in question. It won't be a difficult job, the Sheikh assured me. We have big Europeans as our friends, whose acquaintance you will make. You can be useful to us in our shop. Much of our correspondence is in English, and you can help us with that too. You will of course be our guest, and hence will have no expense whatever. How long do you require my services? I asked. And what will be the payment? Not more than a year. We will pay you a first class return fare and a sum of 105 pounds, all found. This was hardly going there as a barrister. It was going as a servant of the firm but I wanted somehow to leave India. There was also the tempting opportunity of seeing a new country and of having new experience. Also, I could send one or five pounds to my brother and help in the expenses of the household. I closed with the offer without any haggling and got ready to go to South Africa. 
When starting for South Africa, I did not feel the wrench of separation, which I had experienced when leaving for England. My mother was now no more. I had gained some knowledge of the world and of travel abroad and going from Rajkot to Bombay was no unusual affair. This time I only felt the pang of parting with my wife. Another baby had been born to us since my return from England. Our love could not yet be called free from lust, but it was getting gradually purer. Since my return from Europe, we had lived very little together. And as I had now become her teacher, however indifferent and helped her to make certain reforms, we both felt the necessity of being more together, if only to continue the reforms. But the attraction of South Africa rendered the separation bearable. We are bound to meet again in a year, I said to her, by way of consolation, and left Rajkot for Bombay. Here I was to get my passage through the agent of Dada, Abdullah and Co. But no berth was available on the boat, and if I did not sail then, I should be stranded in Bombay. We have tried our best, said the agent, to secure a first-class passage, but in vain, unless you are prepared to go on deck. Your meals can be arranged for in the saloon. Those were the days of my first-class travelling, and how could a barrister travel as a deck passenger? So I refused the offer. I suspected the agent's veracity, for I could not believe that a first-class passage was not available. With the agent's consent, I set about securing it myself. I went on board the boat and met the chief officer. He said to me quite frankly, we do not usually have such a rush. But as the Governor-General of Mozambique is going by this boat, all the boats are engaged. Could you not possibly squeeze me in? I asked. He surveyed me from top to toe and smiled. There is just one way, he said. There is an extra berth in my cabin, which is usually not available for passengers. But I am prepared to give it to you. I thanked him and got the agent to purchase the passage. In April 1893, I set forth full of zest to try my luck in South Africa. The first port of call was Lamu, which we reached in about 13 days. The captain and I had become great friends by this time. He was fond of playing chess, but as he was quite a novice, he wanted one still more of a beginner for his partner, and so he invited me. I had heard a lot about the game, but I had never tried my hand at it. Players used to say that this was a game in which there was plenty of scope for the exercise of one's intelligence. The captain offered to give me lessons and he found me a good pupil as I had unlimited patience. Every time I was the loser and that made him all the more eager to teach me. I liked the game but never carried my liking beyond the boat or my knowledge beyond the moves of the pieces. At Lamu, the ship remained at anchor for some three or four hours and I landed to see the port. The captain had also gone ashore, but he had warned me that the harbour was treacherous and that I should return in good time. It was a very small place. I went to the post office and was delighted to see the Indian clerks there and had a talk with them. I also saw the Africans and tried to acquaint myself with their ways of life, which interested me very much. This took up some time. There were some deck passengers with whom I had made acquaintance and who had landed with a view to cooking their food on shore and having a quiet meal. I now found them preparing to return to the steamer, so we all got into the same boat. The tide was high in the harbour and our boat had more than its proper load. The high current was so strong that it was impossible to hold the boat to the ladder of the steamer. It would just touch the ladder and be drawn away again by the current. The first whistle to start had already gone. I was worried. The captain was witnessing our plight from the bridge. He ordered the steamer to wait an extra five minutes. There was another boat near the ship, which a friend hired for me for ten rupees. This boat picked me up from the overloaded one. The ladder had already been raised. I had therefore to be drawn up by means of a rope and the steamer started immediately. The other passengers were left behind. I now appreciated the captain's warning. After Lamu, the next port was Mombasa and then Zanzibar. 
The halt here was a long one, 8 or 10 days, and we then changed to another boat. The captain liked me much, but the liking took an undesirable turn. He invited an English friend and me to accompany him on an outing and we all went ashore in his boat. I had not the least notion of what the outing meant, and little did the captain know what an ignoramus I was in such matters. We were taken to some negro women's quarters by a tout. We were each shown into a room. I simply stood there dumb with shame. Heaven only knows what the poor woman must have thought of me. When the captain called me, I came out just as I had gone in. He saw my innocence. At first I felt very much ashamed, but as I could not think of the thing except with horror, the sense of shame wore away and I thanked God that the sight of the woman had not moved me in the least. I was disgusted at my weakness and pitied myself for not having had the courage to refuse to go into the room. This in my life was the third trial of its kind. Many a youth, innocent at first, must have been drawn into sin by a false sense of shame. I could claim no credit for having come out unscathed. I could have credit if I had refused to enter that room. I must entirely thank the All-Merciful for having saved me. The incident increased my faith in God and taught me, to a certain extent, to cast off false shame. As we had to remain in this port for a week, I took rooms in the town and saw a good deal by wandering about the neighborhood. Only Malabar can give any idea of the luxuriant vegetation of Zanzibar. I was amazed at the gigantic trees and the size of the fruits. The next call was at Mozambique and thence we reached Natal towards the close of May. The port of Natal is a Durban, also known as Port Natal. Abdullah Sheikh was there to receive me. As the ship arrived at the quay and I watched the people coming on board to meet their friends, I observed that the Indians were not held in much respect. I could not fail to notice a sort of a snobbishness about the manner in which those who knew Abdullah Sheikh behaved towards him, and it stung me. Abdullah Sheikh had got used to it. Those who looked at me did so with a certain amount of curiosity. My dress marked me out from the other Indians. I had a frock coat and a turban, an imitation of the Bengal pagri. I was taken to the firm's quarters and shown into the room set apart for me, next to Abdullah Sheikh's. He did not understand me, I could not understand him. He read the papers his brother had sent through me and felt more puzzled. He thought his brother had sent him a white elephant. My style of dress and living struck him as being expensive like that of the Europeans. There was no particular work then which could be given me. Their case was going on in the Transvaal. There was no meaning in sending me there immediately. And how far could he trust my ability and honesty? He would not be in Pretoria to watch me. The defendants were in Pretoria, and for out he knew they might bring undue influence to bear on me. And if work in connection with the case in question was not to be entrusted to me, what work could I be given to do, as all other work could be done much better by his clerks? The clerks could be brought to book, if they did wrong, could I be? if I also happened to err? So, if no work in connection with the case could be given to me, I should have to be kept for nothing. Abdullah Sheet was practically unlettered, but he had a rich fund of experience. He had an acute intellect and was conscious of it. By practice, he had picked up just sufficient English for conversational purposes, but that served him for carrying on all his business, whether it was dealing with bank managers and European merchants, or explaining his case to his counsel. The Indians held him in very high esteem. His firm was then the biggest, or at any rate, one of the biggest of the Indian firms. With all these advantages, he had one disadvantage. He was by nature suspicious. He was proud of Islam and loved to discourse on Islamic philosophy. Though he did not know Arabic, his acquaintance with the Holy Quran and Islamic literature in general was fairly good. Illustrations he had in plenty, always ready at hand. 
Contact with him gave me a fair amount of practical knowledge of Islam. When we came closer to each other, we had long discussions on religious topics. On the second or third day of my arrival, he took me to see the Durban court. There he introduced me to several people and seated me next to his attorney. The magistrate kept staring at me and finally asked me to take off my turban. This I refused to do and left the court. So here too there was fighting in store for me. Abdullah Sheikh explained to me why some Indians were required to take off their turbans. Those wearing the Muslim costume might, he said, keep their turbans on, but the other Indians on entering a court had to take theirs off as a rule. I must enter into some details to make this nice distinction intelligible. In the course of these two or three days, I could see that the Indians were divided into different groups. One was that of Muslim merchants, who would call themselves Arabs. Another was that of Hindu and yet another of Parsi clerks. The Hindu clerks were neither here nor there unless they cast in their lot with the Arabs. The Parsi clerks would call themselves Persians. These three classes had some social relations with one another. But by far the largest class was that composed of Tamil, Telugu and North Indian indentured and freed laborers. The indentured laborers were those who went to Natal on an agreement to serve for five years and came to be known there as Girmitiyas from Girmit, which was the corrupt form of the English word agreement. The other three classes had none but business relations with this class. Englishmen called them coolies and as the majority of Indians belonged to the laboring class, all Indians were called coolies or Samis. Sami is a Tamil suffix occurring after many Tamil names and it is nothing else than the Sanskrit Swami meaning a master. Whenever therefore an Indian resented being addressed as a Sami and had enough wit in him, he would try to return the compliment in this wise. You may call me Sami but you forget that Sami means a master, I am not your master. Some Englishmen would wince at this while others would get angry, swear at the Indian and, if there was a chance, would even belabor him. For Sami to him was nothing better than a term of contempt. To interpret it to mean a master amounted to an insult. I was hence known as the Coolie Barrister. The merchants were known as Coolie Merchants. The original meaning of the word Coolie was thus forgotten and it became a common appellation for all Indians. The Muslim merchant would resent this and say, I am not a Kohli, I am an Arab or I am a merchant and the Englishman, if courteous, would apologize to him. The question of wearing the turban had a great importance in this state of things. Being obliged to take off one's Indian turban would be pocketing an insult. So I thought I had better bid goodbye to the Indian turban and begin wearing an English hat which would save me from the insult and the unpleasant controversy. But Abdullah Sheikh disapproved of the idea. He said, if you do anything of the kind, it will have a very bad effect. You will compromise those insisting on wearing Indian turbans. And an Indian turban sits well on your head. If you wear an English hat, you will pass for a waiter. There was practical wisdom, patriotism and a little bit of narrowness in this advice. The wisdom was apparent and he would not have insisted on the Indian turban except out of patriotism. The slighting reference to the waiter betrayed a kind of narrowness. Amongst the indentured Indians there were three classes, Hindus, Muslims and Christians. The last were the children of the indentured Indians who became converts to Christianity. Even in 1893 their number was large. They wore the English costume and the majority of them earned their living by service as waiters in hotels. Abdullah Sheikh's criticism of the English hat was with reference to this class. It was considered degrading to serve as a waiter in a hotel. The belief persists even today among many. On the whole, I liked Abdullah Sheikh's advice. I wrote to the press about the incident and defended the wearing of my turban in the court. The question was very much discussed in the papers, which described me as an unwelcome visitor. 
Thus, the incident gave me an unexpected advertisement in South Africa within a few days of my arrival there. Some supported me while others severely criticized my temerity. My turban stayed with me practically until the end of my stay in South Africa. When and why I left off wearing any headdress at all in South Africa, we shall see later.